Hi guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to another retro adventure. And at the end of another week, and the end of another poll, we've got a clear winner with At Your Door for Call of Cthulhu, a modern day Call of Cthulhu adventure. Now, I'll cover that in the desktop in a wee second. And as usual, I'll be back at the end of the video with some other channel related stuff and some other poll related stuff. But a wee reminder that if you'd like to help the channel out, or you'd like to see these videos a week early, or you'd like to get involved in the polls when they're still valid, instead of a week after when I'm speaking about them but they've already closed. Then we've got a Patreon in the description down below. Now we offer the basic package where we offer that, and we're going to be offering some new interesting things at higher levels over the next few weeks. So if you'd like to check that out and see how you can help the channel out, it'd be very much appreciated. But anyway, let's have a look at At Your Door. So, this is At Your Door for Call of Cthulhu. It came out in 1990, and it's by Chaosium. And it's for their Call of Cthulhu Now, a modern day campaign. Now, I've commented before how I found it kind of weird at the time that Call of Cthulhu Now, as a setting, as they went into the 1990s, they rebranded it as Call of Cthulhu 1990s. And then, as that went past, they've rebranded it again since. I think they've gone back to Call of Cthulhu Now. But this adventure being published in 1990 with all of the technology of the time in mind is now set in that time period so it's not a modern adventure it's a 1990s adventure it's retro in its own way so i find it quite interesting how the adventure or the campaign itself has made itself retro even though it was modern when it came out it's now uh, stuck in a time period because obviously it's written without people being able to google everything search the internet without people having mobile phones in their pocket etc etc which changes the storyline somewhat that they can't instantly call for help they can't instantly keep in touch they can't instantly look up information they have to go and research it etc and the tone of the adventure suits that a lot better so, if you were planning on running this, you'd definitely want to keep it in the 1990s without updating it. The adventure itself received some criticism because it does kind of throw in a lot of Cthulhu monsters at you in different parts. Um, although I found that a lot of fun. I've run this in the past and I had a great time running it. Uh, it was a nice sampler into the world of Call of Cthulhu where I could drag out different monsters and different parts of the mythos, not just they're going after one particular beastie. The other thing is, they call it on the cover here a campaign. Now, to some degree it is, but it's really just a really long adventure. The adventures within the campaign often have no resolution. The first part, for example, where they get hired to find a guy, well, you're not going to find him until the end of the adventure, and or the end of the campaign. The end of that particular section, you just find clues, and you're moving on to a different area. So I really wouldn't consider it a campaign. It's just a big adventure. Although there's elements within it that you could use as separate adventures, the particular parts away from the main city... Are quite interesting. Anyway, let's have a look at the back cover and then we'll start going through it. So, At Your Door, a campaign of madness and terror in the days to come. Salvaging our children's heritage, Full Wilderness Incorporated is a wealthy environmental organization dedicated to the maintenance and expansion of protected wilderness reserves. In addition, Full Wilderness funds legitimate biological researches for greater understanding of our natural environment. Dr. Peter Tate, a respected microbiologist from a major grant recipient, disappeared after reporting disturbing research irregularities. Backed by the considerable resources of full wilderness, the investigators undercover facts surrounding Dr. Tate's disappearance. In succeeding adventures, the mythos manifests in ways unexpected and extreme. At Your Door contains six linked adventures, forming a campaign set in the 1990s, constructed to allow players greater freedom of action, Investigators may enter a particular chapter several times as the meaning of earlier events and experiences are understood, or as an alternative meanings are perceived. The effects of the mythos are generally subtle. Confrontations with nigh invincible powers are few. There is ample opportunity for new investigators to succeed and prosper. Well, 
that gives a big clue that this isn't really adventures. It is an adventure in itself. Because if you're going back to previous adventures as you find new clues, you're basically just going back to a different area and investigating further. So you can dip in and out of sections of this as you move backwards and forwards and uncover more and more of the plot that's going on. It's really not linked adventures. It's just one big adventure. Anyway, as found as shown, you know them. Their hand is at your throats, yet you see them not, and their habitation is one is even one with your guarded threshold. Cthulhu and its supplements have won nearly 20 Best of Class Gaming Awards. Editions include French, German, Italian, Japanese, and Spanish. Call of Cthulhu is a role-playing game based on the works of H.P. Lovecraft, in which ordinary people are confronted by demonic beings and forces of the Cthulhu mythos. Players portray investigators of things unknown and unspeakable, decent men and women of the 1920s, who unexpectedly learn dreadful secrets. At Your Door rides adventures set in the 1990s and portrays effects that the mythos could have today. Um, can you say Cthulhu? The pronunciation on the back. I always like that because it isn't the easiest word to pronounce. Inside, well, as it says, the adventure is about the players being hired by an environmental company, a uh, charity, for wilderness, who are investigating the disappearance of a scientist. The scientist, of course, has got involved in Cthulhu Mythos. But it all does come back to sort of environmentalism. But instead of animals and plants being warped by mutagens and chemical spills and uh, genetic engineering, it's actually down to people experimenting with the Cthulhu mythos, with magic, with samples from elder creatures, from unknown monsters, things which man was not supposed to know, which have changed ordinary plants and animals. And that's a theme throughout. It does keep on this idea that you are fighting against the real world being changed somewhat. But instead of it being more normal elements, it is the mythos intruding on the real world. Anyway, we've got breakdowns of the campaign overall, how the players get involved, and then we've got by chapter. These are the individual adventures, but as they are, they're just chapters within a larger adventure. Flicking over, we've got some detailing of important characters, although there's obviously far more about them later on. And we're into the first adventure, the first section, where they get hired by the environmental group Full Wilderness. A scientist has disappeared, and the investigators are the people to go for look for him. Now they meet up, but... The scientist has left a sample of something he was experimenting on, which is obviously a mythos creature, which has alerted uh, Full Wilderness that there's perhaps something deeper going on, something that needs Cthulhu investigators. People who know the strangeness in the world that's going on. And there's some interesting parts in here, but it's basically the just first steps. As they start looking into more, they get attacked by a biker gang who are trying to boot them off. Now, when I ran this, I used it very much like Terminator 2. You know, the bikers carrying their weapons hidden in boxes of roses, um, like the Terminator does in the shopping arcade in Terminator 2. I totally ripped off that ethos to put the images into my players' heads. But we carry on, they get involved with the police. But basically this section's just laying out the first pieces of evidence. You know, they find his journal, they examine his house, go through his computer, track numbers on his phone, um, what database he's connected to. And then we're on to the second part, because the clues just lead on here. Where Peter Tate, the man they're looking for, has bought a house outside the city. So we carry on, and this farm has been part of the same mutagens. Um, everything that's been going on, the sort of mythos mutations. So we've got this animal parts thing, bits of animals stitched together. Got the layout of the farm. There's a few things in here to mislead the players. Some hints of Migo, the fungi from Yagoth, getting involved, but they actually have no part. 
Um, but the plants here are mutated. That's what's been changed by the involvement of the mythos here. The plants are coming alive and infesting people and attacking them. So we move on from there and they're investigating the corporation where Peter Tate was working, Dawn Biazai. So we've got a long section here with the layout of it, different characters within it, whether they break into it, whether they arrange for a tour, things that they can encounter because uh, Shabnagarath is being summoned and it's the dark children of Shabnagarath who are being used to create uh, or who are being milked and the milk is what's causing the mutations. Um, serum blobs, little creatures evolved from the, the milk of the children of Shabnagarath. <laughs> That's getting quite a long phrase. Um, no Pain No Gain where they investigate the missing man's girlfriend, who's also disappeared. She was into bodybuilding, and she's been taking that serum as well. And she has mutated into a giant. And as they locate her, she's in a cave system here. And she kidnaps the players, or stands a chance of kidnapping them and keeping them captive for quite some time. There's a giant puppy. And there's various other things. Now, this is considered to be one of the more interesting parts of the adventure, but I find it quite distasteful. Because part of it is that she wants to have weird mutant babies with one of the investigators. Now, she's a giant. Now, this is getting into weirdly sexual fetishistic terms, where a giant woman is wanting to have babies with an ordinary sized guy and create mutant children. It feels just a bit weird to me. Um, why she needs your assistance in doing stuff, because obviously she's massive. Um, different bodybuilders and other people that they can meet. Where a god shall tread. So they head off to Toronto to follow some leads there. But this adventure, or this section, is twofold. Firstly, it's to introduce Minster Shiny, who is kind of the main villain of the piece. Um, he is behind a lot of what's been going on, and he is a fantastic NPC. Um, Albert Shiny, local Shoggoth. He's a Shoggoth that's been shaped into the shape of a human. Um, I find him absolutely fascinating. My players grew to absolutely hate him because of something that happens later in the adventure, and they wanted to hunt him down and kill him because they absolutely detested what he'd done. Basically, he ate their puppy. But we'll come to that later. Um, there's some stuff going on here with other Mythos creatures trying to get access to the milk for their own schemes. But the second major part of the adventure, or this section, is to keep the players out of the way. Because them returning to the main city, the city of Samson, uh, a fictional city in the Call of Cthulhu mythos, um, is important to happen later. They need to be away for a while. So we go through that section. It's quite a long event, um, part of it. And then we get after the big one. Now this was my favourite part of the adventure to run. Basically, the players get back to this fictional city of Samson, and it gets devastated by an earthquake. The Mythos creatures have brought the Chthonians, the big worms which tunnel under the earth, which cause earthquakes in the Cthulhu Mythos, and have devastated the city. But this creates a post-disaster, post-apocalyptic almost setting, where the players suddenly have none of the advantages of their technology. They can't jump in a car and drive because roads are blocked by rubble. You know, electricity is on and off. They can't access things. They can't phone things. They're totally cut off and they're keeping the investigation going because they're aware bad things are happening. That the mythos is behind almost totally destroying an entire city. So I absolutely adored this section. You know, the wrecked city that illustrated there. Now this is where the players 
found a puppy as they wandered the wrecked streets. They found this dog. They rescued it. And later on, when they encounter Mr. Shiny, they were like, here, look after our puppy for us. And he ate it. Off screen. And they detested it. I really drove them with that. The danger, the, a large part of the later part of this is about a danger to a child. My players could not care about children, but they wanted to get the bad guy because he'd killed a dog. That's the kind of players I've got. Um, we carry on through where they investigate further in the wreckage of the city. They encounter Nyalhotep in his disguise as the Royal Pant. He pops up a few times through this. And eventually there's a large showdown as the players have been asked by Mr. Shiny to locate a child. And he's going to be sacrificed here. And... The players have to face off against Mr. Shiny, a huge amount of Dark Young, even a Chthonian turns up. It's absolute chaos, but they do get access to heavy weapons, so if they want to use bazookas and missile launchers, they can. It's way more action-based than the end of a typical Cthulhu adventure, but we found it really satisfying. Instead of people losing sanity and running away and barely defeating it, they got to blow stuff up. It was an action hero ending, and we really did quite like that. As usual, the later part of the booklet is lots and lots of really nice handouts, lots of things to give to your players to get them to read over, uh, clues in the plot, you know, frames from security videos, handwritten notes... Loads and loads of stuff, newspaper clippings, security footage, ID cards, adverts, everything you could want. The layout of the arena, or the sports stadium. We've got an investigator player card, or player character sheet, and then some send away for information and to buy various Chaosium books. Now, as I said, set in the 1990s, this totally works. Bringing it more up to date, I think, would be problematic. You know, people will have access to too much technology and information. So keeping it in a 1990s setting is great. Um, there's clues set throughout it, which I really liked. It wove the mythos throughout the story. And as I said, it's got an action ending, which is unusual for Call of Cthulhu, but really worked for my group who often don't like Cthulhu because it is kind of downbeat endings. So often my group has made it out to an adventure with only one player alive. Um, a classic adventure I ran, two players made it out alive and only one of those was sane. So that's my usual Call of Cthulhu endings, whereas in this one they got to get access to missile launchers, they got to blow monsters up, and die, um, defeat things heroically. I didn't bother too much with sanity loss at the end because I just enjoyed the tone of it so much. As a fan of post-apocalyptic games, I absolutely adored the section of this after the earthquake. Because post-apocalyptic games, you know, Twilight 2000, etc., tend to let you roleplay in the days after. So in Twilight 2000, there's been the nuclear war, and you are survivors of that. Whereas this lets you live through, or play through, an actual disaster. It's also a wonderful case of misdirection. Because the players think it's about investigating all this stuff that's going on. And then at the very end, it suddenly becomes you're surviving this disaster and trying to stop it becoming far worse. Because the Cthulhu Mythos creatures are totally exploiting the fact that they've wrecked civilization in this area and they can pick over the vulnerable humans it's an absolutely wonderful way of changing the tone of the adventure in a really unexpected way and i absolutely adore this campaign this adventure for that other elements of it well as i said the bit with the giantess i found slightly problematic um, the idea of a giant woman keeping a guy almost as a sex toy really feels fetishistic and awkward. 
But other than that, I really like this adventure. It was a lot of fun. And I do recommend it if you are setting something in the 1990s. So, that was At Your Door, an adventure I've had a whole load of fun running in the past. But that won the poll this week, with some 27% of the vote. Ahead of The Last Submarine for Twilight 2000, on 22%. But, surprisingly enough, for a while, the actual winning one was what came third, was Clones in Space for Paranoia, perhaps the very archetypical, hilarious paranoia adventure. In fourth position, we had Death's Dark Shadow for Warhammer, and finally we had A Doomsday Like Any Other for the Star Trek role-playing game, on only 15% of the vote. Now, they're all wiped out as usual, and we've got a new set. Now, a bunch of these are cribbed from recent polls, as I'd love to cover them. So, let's see which wins. Let's see another book that I really want to do come out. So, we've got Immortal of the Invisible War for Precedence Entertainment in 1993. Now, this is a game I've been gifted and I don't know a lot about. So, I'd love to have a look through and see what makes Immortal completely different. Secondly, we've got Arcane Mysteries of Bar Save for Earthdawn, which came out in 1997. Now, Earthdawn is one of my favourite fantasy games because it's so different from ordinary fantasy. It's almost post-apocalyptic. The world has been devastated and people are um, emerging from underground shelters from this magical chaos that's gone on. It's like the fallout of fantasy games, and I absolutely adore it, so I'd love to cover a book by that. We've got the Psionics Handbook for Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition. Now, it's a lovely illustrated book, and I've covered the Sign Assist's Handbook for 2nd edition, so it'd be nice to follow up with this. And we've got Fading Suns D20. Now, I've covered a couple of De Fading Suns books in the past, and it's a fantastic setting, and I'd love to have a look at the D20 version to see whether it solved any of the problems that I saw in the background, although I doubt it. And finally, we've got Goroth, Slave of the Empire, for the old Star Wars D6 system from West End Games, back in 1995. Now, this is one of my favourite Star Wars source books, because it really sculpts out the control of a planet under the Empire, and was so, so useful to me when I was games mastering Star Wars, because it gave me lots of ideas. So I'd love to cover that as well. But anyway, they're all up in the poll. Let's see which wins. On other channel-related stuff, well... I'm trying to get a cyberpunk red um, easy mode adventure running. Um, there's not been too much interest on Discord, but I'll up a separate video about that in the next few days. We're being going to be offering some new stuff on the Patreon, and again, that'll be a separate video as I detail that out in the next few days. Other stuff, not much going on, and I think I've probably been wittering on for quite long enough as usual. So anyway, thank you very much for watching, but as always, you look after yourselves, and I'll catch you later. Bye now.